and we have a presentation today by staff on reserve policies. But before we go to that, I'd like to ask, are there any members of the public wishing to comment on a topic not on today's agenda? Seeing none, let us go forth. Okay. Mr. Samario. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Bob Samario, Finance Director. And we're here to talk about reserve policies. And, and before I get into that, it occurred to me as I was walking over or driving over that it might be helpful if we just kind of um, talked about what reserves are, how, are you, how do we measure them, what they represent, because I think over the years they've proven to be a pretty elusive concept and a lot of people have a misunderstanding, including at times myself, on what, you know, what are reserves, how do you calculate them. And um, I was thinking back that my predecessor, Bob Pearson, and I would spend hours, you know, just trying to figure out how do we better explain reserves and we ourselves we get wrapped around the axle because it's not an easy thing and when you get into the details. Um, but in concept, it's a pretty simple um, calculation. And the way I would sort of explain it is that um, we have um, money in the bank, and, but mon those monies are obligated for expenditures that are upcoming. And I, I see the reserves that we'll be talking about as monies that are available for council to spend above and beyond things that it's already committed to spend. So it's money in the bank. It's not necessarily just cash because there are other factors in that, but it's money that you might have available or do have available at any given point in time to spend on, on extra stuff. So what can we appropriate, you know, for new projects, new programs, new, new, new costs? That's what reserves are. And we always talk in terms of what's spendable, and it's those spendable cash portion of reserves that we, if council wanted to spend something new, they can do so with these funds. So, um, and as you know, we have a policy that, that dictates what reserves we should have, and we're going to provide some background and all that. So. We'll start with just the fact that back in May of 2011, um, the Finance Committee received a report from staff and reserve policies, and we did this in connection with the, with the budget. When we, when we, you might recall that when we submit the recommended budget in around April, we come to the Finance Committee and talk about certain topics, and at that time, the committee wanted to talk about reserves and the policies and all that in light of the fact that we've fallen below our reserve policies over the last several years. And so um, the recommendation coming out of the, com the, the, council, the committee, excuse me, it was that we'd go to council, get some general direction, and then come back to the finance committee and discuss them in, in detail and go over them, see if there are any, any opportunities for changing them, um, updating them, refining them, and so forth, since it's really been, you know, 15 years or more than that since we've, we've adopted those policies. So we did go back to the council in July of 2011, and we did get some comments and suggested changes from then, which we'll go over. And that since at that point, then it was referred to the Finance Committee for discussion, and that's where we're here at today. So the current reserve policies are, have been dictated by a resolution that was ad adopted in 1995, number 95-157. And um, you probably know this, but the re resolution actually applies to all of our operating funds. It doesn't apply to every single fund we have. For example, uh, funds such as the Creeks Restoration Fund, which is a special revenue fund, our CDBG fund, our streets funds, those are, are sort of special types of funds. Um, our reserve policies don't apply to them. They only apply to our general fund and enterprise funds, the main operating funds we have within the city. There's about seven enterprise funds and then, of course, just the general fund. And these policies do not apply to our internal service funds as well. We, we have these funds that account for uh, centralized services like vehicle maintenance and replacement. We don't have any policies that um, right now that apply to those funds, although we do have some reserves we've accumulated, which we'll talk about that later. So the reserves, there are three buckets um, that are provided for in the resolution. The first is the reserve for capital. And the, uh, ostensibly, the purpose of this capital reserve is to fund major capital pro projects or overruns. In the general fund, back in 95, it was established as a fixed amount, $1 million, recognizing that the general fund doesn't have the kind of capital programs or costs that, a, for example, an enterprise fund would have. So it was established as a fixed amount of $1 million. <clears throat> Excuse me. For enterprise funds, the calculation is dramatically different because it varies, and it's, it, it's either calculated on 5% of the net book value of assets, or fixed assets, or the average of the previous three years' capital funding. So the 5%, what we do is we say, what's the total cost, the total assets they have on their books, fixed assets like buildings and water mains or whatever those are, less whatever we've depreciated, and that's the net book value, and we take 5% of that and evaluate that against the... 
the other option, which is the average of how much they funded from their operating revenues for the capital program in the last three years. And so those, those are the, the two options we use. We typically take the more conservative approach of those two. So whatever is a higher of those two numbers, we typically will establish that as a reserve. The reserve for emergencies or disasters, it's, it's a percentage of the operating budget. So whatever the operating budget is the following year, the adopted budget, we use that as a basis. So for example, if we have a, an operating budget of $100 million, then 15% of that is $15 million. So that, that's how it's established. So it's always a moving target. So, and as our operating budgets grow over time, so do our reserve requirements. If they shrink, then they'll go down. And we did see that shrinkage in the last few years, but we're back under the growth mode. And it's intended to provide, as the name indicates, um, funds for in cases of emergencies and natural disasters. And it's, and it's really providing for, uh, I would say, the major kinds of events, not uh, maybe a fire that has minimal damage, but like what we experienced back in 95 and, the late, and also in 2005. And in 98, actually, we had the big floods here, or the big storms where we had major damage. It's for those kinds of events, obviously, earthquakes would be covered, um, major fires that affected the city. And one of the things that, always, that we always have to keep in mind is that in addition to the fact that we would have extraordinary costs initially and even in the medium term to, to responding to those emergencies, one of the potential impacts, depending on the magnitude of the, of the disaster, is a loss of revenue. If we had a major earthquake that destroyed a big part of our downtown, you know, we wouldn't see the kind of tourism we're seeing now. And, and so our bed tax and sales taxes would go down, at least in the short term, until we were able to rebuild. And that's something we have to kind of keep in mind. And we don't have insurance for, for business interruption. We have insurance that covers our facilities to be able to rebuild them, but nothing to provide us monies for loss of revenues. Um, now, we, we know that we will get some relief from, from FEMA, the federal agency, and CalEMA. Um, they will cover a good portion of those costs, at least the portions that aren't insured, but you know they won't always call it, cover it all, and there's a cash flow consideration because they're not always quick to reimburse us for those costs. And then we have the last one, the Reserve for Future Years budget. This is one we've actually uh, used over the last 10 years, um, by, and mostly by design. It's 10% of the annually adopted operating budget. And it's essentially intended to provide for economic contingencies or, or, or um, times of economic downturn like we've just had. The idea or the, con the thinking was that um, when we have periods of declining revenues, and rather than having to make dramatic cuts to the organization, that we would be able to utilize these reserves to help sort of manage ourselves through those periods. Uh, and then with the idea that we would be able to restore the res those reserves over a period of time once we re recovered. So it's just to manage, or manage the organization through periods of economic downturns. The policy requires or <coughs> suggests that any use of reserves should be accompanied by a plan for replenishment within a reasonable time period. And the one thing I wanted to mention is that um, the 15 and 10% aren't, aren't really arbitrary in um, in discussing this with my predecessor, because he was involved with this, that the, the, the thought process was that we wanted to have three months worth of operating costs of covered uh, in our reserves. So even though we have one set aside for, for economic contingencies, obviously the full 25% would be available in a case of a disaster. And so 25% or three months is not a lot of time. You know, most financial advisors would suggest to you that on a personal level, you should have six months of reserves. We have three. Um, and again, that's just to cover operating costs, which would which pretty much continue. It doesn't even talk about loss of revenues, as I mentioned. And then lastly, we have what's called an appropriated reserve. Um, this is an amount that's actually budgeted every year. It's not sort of set, it's not sort of part of a reserve balance that's in, in savings in a sense. We appropriate 0.5% of the operating budget. We used to do this pretty consistently. If we were to do it today, it would be on the order of um, if I can, about $500,000, maybe $550,000. We no longer do that. We stopped doing that about four, five, six years ago because it was never utilized. Um, we are now more closer to about 150000 that we set aside in appropriated reserves. However, enterprise funds actually still use this policy and to guide them in how much they create as an appropriated reserve. For example, water, the water fund, they'll look at their operating budget and set aside as an appropriated reserve about half a percent. So it's just a general fund where we've kind of gone away from that traditional half, half, a, cent, half a percent appropriated reserve. It just wasn't necessary. <clears throat> 
So some policy considerations, and we kind of talked about this when we were with council uh, back in July, like with a big question, what are, or what is an appropriate level of reserves? And that's, it's more of an esoteric discussion because there is no right answer. I mean, it just depends. Um, I think we mentioned before that there have been a number of surveys done by both cities through a listserv that we use with finance officers, but also bond rating agencies have gone and done some surveys, and their answer or their conclusion has have been that one size does not fit all. It really depends the, on the agency, the organization, and um, some factors that they, you know, I think we should consider in determining what is an appropriate level of reserves are, one, what, how susceptible are we to economic impacts? So are our revenues stable or do they fluctuate based on the economic cycles? And as you know, we are very susceptible to economic impacts as we've seen in the last 10 years. Whereas a community that's more of a bedroom community or city that had, um, whose revenues are pretty stable, maybe property taxes, little in sales taxes, um, they're, they're not relying on a lot of tourism for, to, for their um, budgets. So they're probably not going to need as much in terms of a, a reserve than maybe the city of Santa Barbara might because we are we have volatile revenues. The size of the operating budget I think is important. I think if you look at the city of LA, I can't imagine that they're going to put aside $25 million of their operating budget in a reserve because I think, frankly, politically, the pressure would be too great to spend that money. I just don't see them ever getting to that level, whereas a city who has much smaller, maybe a $50 million budget or $100 million budget, it's easier to come up with 25 percent or justify 25 percent as an operating budget or an operating reserve. Um, susceptibility to natural disasters I think is important out here. We are susceptible to tsunamis, earthquakes, floods, fires, you know, everything. So I think we have to keep, keep that in mind. And, and as I mentioned before, while we have insurance and, and FEMA and Calima would step in, you know, if they're not going to cover all their costs and they're not going to certainly cover all the, all the um, losses of revenues that we might have in, that situa in those situations. <coughs> and then finally, I think something to consider are reserves we have in other funds. And um, one of the things that, we've, that has occurred over the last 10 years when we've seen our reserves in the general fund decline is that we've correspondingly been building up reserves in, in other areas. Um, one of the areas, for example, is in our vehicle replacement fund. We used to be what's called on a, on a pay-as-you-go basis, but over the last several years, a conscious decision was made to start putting money aside to have the full replacement value of those vehicles in the bank as, we're, you know, as they're ready to be replaced. It's sort of the same concept as you would for a, for a pension. You know, it's, it, the, ideally, when the, when the person retires or when the vehicle needs replacement, you would have the money in the bank to do so, and we've gotten there now for just about all of our, our vehicles. And so those are the reserves that we have that are available to us if we need it in a disaster, for example, or the or purpose. So this is a schedule showing reserves as of June 30, 2011. We measure reserves at the end of each fiscal year once we close the books. And, I'm, and this shows you our main operating funds, the general fund, of course, all of the enterprise funds, as well as the internal service funds that have reserve reserve balances. The first three columns relate to the policy reserves we've just been talking about. As you can see, it's only the general fund and enterprise funds that are subject to the policy. All other funds are not, but they still have reserves, and we'll kind of go through them. Um, the general fund, as you can see, has a required reserve policy of $15.3 million. The required policy for future year's budget is about $10 million, but we have 2.6 actually in the bank. We're about $7 million or $6 million short of where we should be. But still, we have 18.9, almost $19 million in reserves, which is about 18% of our overall budget right now. So it's not an inconsequential number. It just happens to be below what our policy says we should have. Enterprise funds individually are much smaller than, than the general fund so that their reserve requirements are, are less. Um, for example, the water fund, the $3.9 million represents 15% of their operating budget, and 2.6 is 10%. But if you look at the capital, it's, it's a much larger number because it's calculated on either the previous three years' capital funding, the average, or 5% of the net, net fixed assets. So it's a big number, which makes sense because they have a lot of capital expenditures and, it's, and they have that as sort of a cushion and a, as needed for, you know, for, for cost overrun or an unexpected project cost. Um, so they have a healthy amount there, um, but they have $25 million in reserves as of June 30, 2011, more than the general fund does. They have $13 million above policy, which are going to be used this year and, 
and next, actually the next several years for major projects they have planned, but a fair amount of money they have. The wastewater fund, they have $3.9 million in reserves, airport $5 million. These are all reserves above policy on the last, second to last column, column. So those are amounts that are available to be spent on whatever purpose they might have or need. I'll point out the waterfront fund. You can see they don't have a capital reserve balance, but they do have in the other column $3.7 million. And we'll talk about this in a little bit later, but um, their reserves are, they have a, what's called a harbor preservation fund where they accumulate reserves for, for providing, for maintaining the wharf and the harbor. And those reserve balances um, are, have been determined by policy to satisfy their capital reserve requirements. And again, we'll talk about that more later. The solid waste fund, as you know, we, we currently, we just recently converted that into an, or started classifying that as an enterprise fund. And so it's not in the past been subject to this policy. And, and as you know, we are, we, we are below where we would like to be there. We have $651,000 in reserves, um, but eventually we're gonna start building those up and start meeting those reserve requirements. And then downtown parking, they have a healthy set of level of reserves at $5 million. In the internal service funds, you could see, as I mentioned, no, no policy reserve requirements, but they do have reserves we've accumulated over the last number of years. Um, in our interest city services fund, that's for the building maintenance and facilities maintenance um, fund. We have $2 million that's available for things such as um, replacing carpets and, and painting and those kinds of things. The fleet replacement, a healthy reserve number, almost 7.4, about 50 or 60% of that relates to the general fund because we pay in, but so do enterprise funds. They also pay into that program, so um, they have a, a corresponding share. So it's not all available to the general fund. Our fleet maintenance fund has a small reserve, about half a million dollars. Self-insurance fund has reserves, and this is as of June 30, 2011. We had reserves above what we needed of $4.2 million. We're down to about $700,000 there because in this year we budgeted a rebate to the general fund and enterprise funds of about $3.5 $3 million. That was one of the things we realized we had more than we really needed. We were fully covering all of our, our liabilities and the 4.2 was extra, and so we rebated that back to all enterprise and general funds. And then lastly, our information systems fund that's for, maintains all of our computers, networks, and the like. They have a, a reserve of almost $900,000. But in total, you can see citywide, we have $80.2 million in reserves, all of which would be available in, if we needed to, for example, in a disaster, um, about 36 or $36.2 million is subject or pursuant to city policy. The remaining balances are excess or above that amount. So citywide, I think we are financially in pretty good condition, uh, you know, in spite of the fact that in the general fund, we are slightly below our reserve requirements overall. I think financially we're in good shape. Any questions on this schedule before I move on? Other considerations, um, and we've talked about this in the past, the general fund capital reserve, the million dollar fixed amount has never been used. We've never tapped into that. The reserves are established as a percentage of the operating budget. And as I would say that there, I'm sure there are some cities out there that uh, established a fixed amount for reserves where there's a cap, for example. It's not just a variable of the operating budget. Um, ours is, a, is percentage based, so it'll always move with the, the growth of the budget. And it's an important thing to remember because in order for us to always stay fully fully funded, if, to the extent our budget grows, we have to generate a surplus each year just to fund that additional requirement. And I'll, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean. Let's say, for example, we our budget grows from one year to the next by $4 million. That means that we have to come up with an additional $1 million to satisfy our 25% reserve requirements, right? So that has to come from surpluses. So any year that we grow $4 million, for example, we need to end a year with a surplus to maintain a, an equilibrium in our reserve balances. And that's sometimes forgotten. And so when we see these reserve balances, surpluses at the end of the year, we forget that, well, part of that is just to keep us whole, you know? And another consideration is that the, currently any use of reserves currently uh, requires council approval, a simple majority. Um, and so we do, we come to council anytime we propose to use the reserves, whether it's part of the adopted budget or anytime mid of the year, we say we need to appropriate some, some of those reserves. Council has to approve that. And then lastly, the policy currently doesn't require 
a plan for restoring policy reserves. So we've, we've come to council to appropriate reserves. Even though we're below policy, we've never really come back and never at the same time said, here's how we're going to get there. Other than sort of in the abstract there, eventually we're going to have to kind of restore those reserves. So the feedback we got from council back in July um, were, were that, one, that the use of policy reserves, not just any reserves, but policy reserves should require that it be accompanied with a plan for restoring reserves so that there be a specific plan or how we're going to get back to those, those levels that we should have. That it should require regular reports to council on the status of reserves. And I will tell you that, you know, we do and have come to, count to the committee and council and I guess to me the, the, the barometer is if council feels like they've not been communicated enough on the status of reserves then we've not done a good enough job. So one of the things we might want to look at and we'll be recommending is that we just do a better job of and we're coming to council and the committee more frequently anytime we use reserves to make sure we, the council understands where we're at at that, at that moment. And then um, that the purpose and allowable uses of reserves for future years budget should not change. However, such uses should be better defined. And this, I think, came out of you, Mr. Uh, Mr. White, that not looking, you know, we weren't hoping to see any change on the fact that we would be allowed to use those reserves for economic um, contingency purposes, but that we maybe come up with a set of criteria or a better understand when we, what that really means, what's the criteria for that. Um, we also had a, a suggestion that we eliminate the $1 million capital reserve and that we also, that, again, consider reserves and other funds. And then one of the recommendations also was that we consider the recommendations of the infrastructure task, task force. Um, you know, as you know, that was a, a, a group that was formed, I think, in 2007, eight, just before the recession hit, um, to look at ways and alternatives for financing major infrastructure projects or capital, like a police headquarters, um, for example. And they developed they developed a report and some recommendations. And I wanted to kind of at least. Um, provide you the, the more um, relevant recommendations. One was that, they, that we, the recommendations indicated that we should revise the current policy to commit the city to immediately increase efficiency of all resources under its, its control by 2 to 3 percent annually to free up additional funds for infrastructure needs. And I think um, by necessity we've kind of done that with the, because of the loss of revenues. I think we've become a lot more efficient. We've shrunk the organization by 7 or $8 million in the last few years. But that was one of the recommendations. Um, they also recommended that we re revise the resolution to commit the city to implement and achieve an annual 10 percent, essentially surplus or off the top general fund capital allocation no later than fiscal year 2012 to be spent annually on, annually on infrastructure projects. So it's really to say we're going to dedicate 10 percent of our, our revenues each year and commit that to um, infrastructure projects. They also recommended that we revise our capital reserve requirement to 5 percent of the estimated replacement value of capital assets instead of book value. And this really only applies to enterprise funds. And the idea is that when we um, record the acquisition or the construction of capital assets, it's always based on cost. But as time goes by, we know the, the replacement value grows. We spend $50 million on a big piece of a, of a building. We know that 15 years from now, it's not going to be 50 million, and so their suggestion is when we look at that 5 percent number of net book value, we base it on the value of the, of the replacement value, not just historical cost, which is obviously is well below what the replacement value would be. And they also suggested that instead of a $1 million capital reserve, that it be established at a fixed amount, but at $5 million, in addition to the 10 percent they recommended for to be taken off the top. And they just again recommended that what we're doing today is to reevaluate the current resolution to see if it needs to be updated based on the fact that it's been more than a decade, at least when this report was done, that we last looked at this. So um, here are our recommendations. The staff have given the, what council's directions were and everything else. Um, our recommendations are that we retain the current 25 percent reserve requirement. I think it would be prudent personally. I sometimes worry that it's not enough just because of what I mentioned because the loss of revenues potentially would, could be substantial. Um, recommend that as council suggested we eliminate the general fund, can't, general fund capital reserve the million dollars and it doesn't just go away. We just sort of add that million dollars to a reserve for future year's budget 
and that we allocate future general fund surpluses as follows. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, that the any surpluses first be used to fund the increased reserve requirements based on the growth of the operating budget. That was my $4 million, $1 million example. So that the, any surpluses go first to maintaining our fully funded reserves or our status on those reserves. Secondly, that we allocate half of the remaining surplus to a capital sinking fund, so we would just sweep it into another fund that we use and accumulate for, for major infrastructure projects. That the, and the remaining 50% of the remaining surplus be um, to use to restore reserves until they're fully replenished. So once we close that $7 million shortfall, uh, we would until then we would allocate half of those that surplus to, to achieving that goal. And then after we've, and then after that, um, the surplus would be, would be, um, I guess the, the point is, once we've restored the reserves to where they should be, then 100% of any remaining surplus would go toward financing, uh, to go into this capital sinking fund, and that we would still try to fund the annual program for capital within all those all those resources. So you know, we we, we don't. This is not instead of the annual program we have about 750 thousand to a million dollars for capital. Any allocation to the sinking fund would be above and beyond that just to accumulate monies for bigger projects. So rather than, you know, we we'll still do the playgrounds every year and, and those kinds of things, but the bigger projects, we set aside money from the surpluses as we're uh, recommending here. And that for any recommended use of policy reserves, so not just reserves that are above policy, but any policy reserves that we require the following, that is status of reserve balances, approval by a supermajority of council, which means at least five votes in order to um, approve that, and then a specific plan for the replenishment of those reserves proposed to be used. So the, our recommendation is that, again, any policy re reserves that are proposed to be used, that we would bring to you a status of the reserves, a supermajority would be required, and we would come to you at that same time with a plan for how we restore them, how and when. And then um, uh, one other one, since I mentioned earlier on that we don't have a reserve policy that applies to internal service funds, even though they're, they're really operating funds in a sense, our vehicle maintenance fund is an operating fund, our facilities fund is an operating fund, that we establish a 10% operating reserve in, in those funds because it's prudent to do so. And then with regard to long-term cap capital financing, um, just wanted to kind of give you a, a sort of a heads up on this. We have no policies that have been adopted applicable to the accumulation of funds for, for, for capital projects, large projects like for police buildings and other large pieces of, of equipment or facilities. And, you know, as we're moving forward um, and times are better now, we should, we should be thinking about accumulating and finding a way to accumulate more funds um, and then therefore establishing some policies for that. So we would be coming to you in the, in the next year to two years um, with some proposed policies for how we start accumulating large sums of money because as I said it, you know it's we're going to be looking to build up millions and millions of dollars and, and, and set them aside and there's always that pressure to spend those and it's always good to have policies that say here's how we should accumulate them um, and how they can be used um, we're not there yet because we haven't accumulated you know large amounts of money yet but as we start to do that um, a poli some policies will be appropriate to put into place so we'll be doing that in the next couple of years. And then lastly, the waterfront capital reserves, uh, just so you, to point out that they are actually guided by a separate resolution. Um, and you know, a number of years ago, I'm not even sure when, but it was before I got here, there was an actual fund created for maintaining the harbor. It's called the Harbor Preservation Fund. It's actually been codified into our ordinances. And this fund was, is used to accumulate capital monies or funds for the benefit of the harbor and the wharf. The policy that was adopted in 1999 provides that they will have at least $2 million in this Harbor Preservation Fund, but up to a maximum of $5 million for those capital needs. The, the policy doesn't, isn't different when it comes to the disaster reserve or the budgetary reserve, but it's just this capital reserve requirement that's specifically for the Harbor Preservation Fund. Um, but they, they haven't looked at that for 13 years. And so uh, Waterfront staff is going to be working with our Harbor Commission to, to kind of go through this process to say, you know, do we, do we need to tweak that policy? Do we want to maybe index a $5 million to a higher number? Because obviously times have changed. Things are more expensive. So they'll be doing that in the next 
several months, six months, and then coming back to the, to the Finance Committee based on those recommendations. So um, that concludes my report, and I, I will mention that, um, you know, this is an important topic, and we have, and we can, you know, there's, I'm sure, lots to talk about, so I, I don't want the committee to feel like we have to make decisions today. We can have multiple meetings, do whatever is necessary to kind of go through this and work our way through these uh, recommendations and what you'd like to see before we go back to council. So I just wanted to, you know, obviously not put pressure on you. We have time. This is just the beginning of this process. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Sure, you're welcome. Before we go to committee member questions, I'd like to ask if there are any members of the public who'd like to comment at this time. We have a lady in the back. I'm a member of the public, a lady in back. The new name God gave me is Dawn. My real birth certificate name is Dinah Marianne Wellsand. It's nice to meet all of you today here. This is the first time I've been in the city planning, city hall building. I'd like to settle down in Santa Barbara. I think it's the most beautiful city in the world. I have no further comment. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Scott Burns. I'm a member of the Park and Rec Commission, and I was a member of the Infrastructure Financing Task Force that we met in 2008, started in 2007. Uh, just as a comment, um, the comments that the staff has brought up on uh, the uh, 95, 157, and 156, we, the Infra Infrastructure Task Force, had about five recommendations concerning those, and I appreciate that the financing is going on and that we are going forward with it. And as we become, when we begin to have more money, which it looks like we're beginning to have, let's make sure we spend some time looking at the buildings because we really haven't uh, taken care of them very well in the last few years. And I, I hope uh, as you go forward with this that you, uh, you do that. The Parks Department uh, has a lot of unfunded capital needs and we want to make sure those get handled. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burns. Hi, I'm B.B. Longstreet from the Parks and Recreation Commission and we're both here because it is such an important topic to us as a commission, the maintenance of our facilities and we support the recommendations to really look to the future because those are what help us achieve our revenue um, goals in the department and keep the programs happening for the community and uh, those are very important spaces to everyone so thank you thank you Ms. Longstreet okay seeing no other members of the public rising up I'll now close public comment and uh, entertain questions from committee members Mr. White thank you Mr. Chair um, I actually did have a question on that uh, reserve policies slide and I I heard uh, you say, Mr. Samario, I, I understood you to say that the wastewater reserves, that there wasn't a policy reserve, it was somehow, uh, and I just, I got lost on what you were talking about with the, with the wastewater reserve. But that's, I don't imagine it's any different than, than any of the others, but. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair um, and Committee Member White, I, I'm assuming you're referring to the Solid Waste Fund? Well, I was just looking at the wastewater line. Was was when I heard you, heard you say something that the wastewater yeah the wastewater fund is is subject to the policy. You can see they have 1.7 million dollars in reserves um, for disasters. They don't have any reserves above policy. Um, that's why there's nothing in the other column. They're actually underfunded in their capital reserves um, by a couple million dollars, I believe. Um, but no, there's they're could fully. You, could you walk? I, I, I'm just lost in, in what you're talking about. Okay, there. so sure. So the wastewater fund, would we'll you as an example? Right. There, the policy, as we talked about, um, requires three reserve buckets, if you will, one for disasters, 
which is calculated as 15% of the operating budget. Okay. The future year's budget or, or economic uncertainty um, reserve, which is 10% of the operating budget. Right. And then the capital budget is different bet be between the general fund and the enterprise funds. The general fund is $1 million fixed. In enterprise funds, the capital reserve is calculated differently. Um, most times it's based on the average of the previous three years right. funding for capital from operating revenues. We don't include, for example, funding from federal or state grants because that would sort of distort things. So whatever funding has come out of the enterprise funds operating revenues over the last three years for capital, we, we take an average of that and we establish that as a reserve requirement. So in the water fund, right above that, you can see they have a capital reserve established of 5168 That represents the average of the last three years funding for capital from their operating revenues. To the right of that, if they have any reserves in excess of what the policy says which they should have, it, that's, the, that's in the other column. And um, some of those monies may be designated for a certain purpose. Like, for example, I know in the water fund, I think about almost $3 million is set aside in the other column for reactivation of the desal plant, should we ever need that. So they have a sort of a designation. Not, it's not subject to any reserve policies, but they have that money set aside. Um, and as I said below, the waterfront fund, it doesn't have any, anything in the capital reserve column because they have their separate policy that says they're going to accumulate funds in a harbor preservation fund between $2 million and $5 million, and those reserves that they have are deemed to be to satisfy the capital reserve requirement. And it's roughly about the same as what they would be required to have anyway. So and that's that, the 3750. That's the 3750. The harbor preservation right. fund at this point. Right. Okay. And so that's how the, the works. The, you know, the enterprise funds and the general fund are subject to the same calculation for disaster reserves and future years budgets just different for capital and and I might I might just add so if you look at the water, wastewater fund they're actually below policy reserves a capital reserve isn't fully funded and that was a decision that actually was made by the council I think a year or so ago to fund some additional pipe replacement and 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 you it was a conscious decision made by the council if you look at the golf fund they're also, you'll see there's no capital reserves. They're actually below even on future budget reserves. And I think we've, over the past year, pointed out they're having some financial difficulties. And then the solid waste fund, which is what Bob referred to a few minutes ago, that fund was established about eight or nine years ago after the, the policies came into effect, and there was no reserve policy established. And, and the reason that's a little more difficult one is that, if you recall on that fund, most of the money that comes through that fund is the ratepayers pay for their trash collection, and then we just send that to a contractor. And so it probably doesn't make sense to have 10% reserves plus another 15% reserves because most of that money is a pass-through to the contractor. It used to be that we held that as a trust fund. The money came in, the money went out, and it didn't even show on the city's books. But we decided when we created the recycling activities to have it as an enterprise activity and then run some money through there to fund the staff that's there and also the closure cost at Elaine's Park and things like that. Great, thank you. And in fact, I'll add that if we were to establish a reserve of 25% based on the true operations, less what we just passed through, we would be closer to about $400,000 in reserve requirements. And at, as of June 30, at least, we would have satisfied those reserve requirements. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Murillo, any questions? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, it feels good that there's so much money in that other column, though it's a little mysterious other. So maybe another time you can explain to me how that money accumulates. And, you know, some people keep an eye on those fat reserves. So I'm curious, you know, in general to know <clears throat> how that money accumulates. Um, I'm the liaison to the Parks and Rec Commission, and I had a call that day that you all talked about the infrastructure task force report. I was watching on television from my sick bed to let you know, um, but I am interested in seeing a written report of it. Um, I like reading stuff on paper, so just a request that I would like to look at that, and I appreciate um, Commissioners Longstreet and Burns being here to make their pitch. I 
I was watching it on television that day. I was persuaded by the conversation um, that uh, savings and or, or that um, funds should be. Uh, I, I what am I trying to say? I was persuaded by your arguments um, and the discussion. Um, and I'm curious who was on the task force, and I guess that would be in the report that I get. So thank you very much. Um, so you're talking about changing subject here, um, creating an operating reserve fund for the internal service fund. Isn't the internal service fund already a reserve fund? So you're making a reserve fund on a reserve fund? Or am I not getting that right? Mr. Chair, Mayor, Mr. Com Committee Member Muriel, um, some of our internal service funds are really operating funds just like an enterprise fund. And I'll give you an example. The interest city services funds, they, they are responsible for maintaining our communication systems, electronics, communications. They also are responsible for, for maintaining our facilities, custodial services, and the like. So they do have an operating budget. They have staff and operating costs, materials, supplies, and the like. Um, and so having a reserve of 10% or whatever that may be for operations makes sense. We wouldn't, for example, recommend that we have a reserve of, or an operating reserve in the fleet replacement fund because that's not an operating fund. So I, I guess to clarify, it's not for all internal service funds, it's just those that have operations. The fleet maintenance fund is, as you described, is nothing more than a fund where we accumulate reserves for replacement of vehicles and then we buy the vehicles. But very little staffing or operating operations go on there. So I think where would it be appropriate would be in our information systems fund, which is an operating fund, our interest city services fund, and um, that's it. Probably those two funds would be applicable, I would say, would, would be subject to a 10 percent operating reserve recommendation. The others wouldn't need it. And, and I might add on the interest city services fund, at some point we probably need to break out the operating part of that program, which is the custodians, the plumbers, the electricians, the communication specialist, and then they also have reserves for HVAC replacement and um, that's the heating, ventilation, air conditioning, roofs, um, painting, carpeting, and, and break those two out like we've done in the fleet maintenance operation where we have a fleet maintenance fund which is the mechanics and purchasing of parts and things and then the fleet replacement fund. There we have them combined together and that's why the number is probably bigger than 10%. I don't know if that made sense to you. It would be 10 percent of what, too, by the way? What? The, the annual operating part of their budget, the salaries and benefits and supplies, not the replacement part of it. And if I could clarify, I think the 10 percent would probably be applicable to the fleet maintenance funds as well. Okay. And then I, I was looking at when you were talking about the long-term capital financing and I was thinking about the loss of our RDA funds, and I, I'm not sure if that there really is a nexus there, but that's what my brain did. And so we have to plan, right, for that RDA um, resource being gone. So I'm concerned about that, and I'm not sure how that fits into this conversation, but I think it how does. would you respond, uh, I think Mr. It, Samario? It, it, I think it plays in directly to this conversation, of, at least for long-term financing of, our, of infrastructure. We were able to have the RDA fund a lot of major facilities improvements. Uh, Fire Station 1 was a, is a good example. That was fully funded from the RDA. Uh, that would have had to come from general fund resources to, to, for that same thing. The police headquarters were accumulating funds for that uh, par part of that cost. So the loss of the RDA in terms of financing infrastructure projects is a big hit to us. Keep in mind, though, that the RDA was scheduled to go out of existence in 2015, so we would have to have been dealing with that at some point, but just now we're having to deal with that sooner than later. So, yeah, I think long term the city's going to have to come up with a strategy for how we finance some of these larger pieces of, of larger buildings and facilities. Some of that may have to just come from issuing long term debt of some sort to do so because to accumulate $50 million is, would be difficult. But I think it should be balanced with accumulation of some funds, and it requires some strategy and some planning and some discipline to do that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, comments from the committee members? Mr. White? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll jump in somewhere anyway. The, the, um, as, as I started my council career, uh, the, the pieces that surprised me uh, 
two of the pieces that surprised me were the fact that we had cr that the city had created this excellent reserve system going back was it 20 years ago 20 plus years ago that that's got started with the, the 10 and 15 percent uh, 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 reserve of emergency and then rain using the term rainy day got there and then when times were good most of the rainy day money went away. I used to use the term, you know, that we were using our rainy day money when the sun was out. And that's one of the reasons why I've asked that we've had this conversation today is that that uh, I had would see that money as having been useful starting two years ago, two or two plus years ago, maybe three or two to three years ago, when we fell off a cliff and we would have had that $10 million to start to smooth out some of that crash. So that I'm, I'm hoping that the conversation that we have today uh, will help future councils um, have that tool so that we're using the money, we're, we're accumulating the money, number one, number two, that we're using it in, uh, in during a rainy, using the rainy, day fund for a rainy day. Uh, so that's that's just, uh, I don't want to bureaucratize it too much. I, it's sort of common, again, you've talked about it as needing six months for, you know, what we are what we as people are supposed to have is six months of, of, of our, our annual needs in cash. Well, um, how do we, how do we make this simple, clean going forward that's really a strong voice to, to accomplish that. So that's number one. Number two, it's just on a completely, it, it's, it's not a completely separate track, but, it's a, but it's a, it is another track, and that is the fact that our, infra, that our buildings, w that we're using up our buildings, we're not just using them. We are using them up. And how do we, I mean, and, and, and we're even, we've, we've talk, talked about this with our streets. We're using, we're not keeping our streets in the, in the condition a, a stable condition every year. They're, they're, we, we we're able to pull it back up to a to a be, uh, a level that we feel good about, or that, we're, or that meets our standards, shall we say, with the recovery money that sort of got us back back up. But um, that's a daunting task at this stage uh, of history. And uh, I know that, you know, again, another pot over there that, we, that we've started talking about here that's, that I think we're, again, opening the box is, is the pensions as another one. I mean, that's another kind of like infrastructure liability out there is at least the way I kind of frame it in my head so that, uh, that we're, not, we're not fully funding these needs. So I'm looking for ways to, you know, to, to send that message to future councils uh, that the, we're going to maintain those, uh, we're going to accumulate those rainy day reserves, and we're going to and we can, and we, it's okay to use them during rainy times. So, uh, kind of homey analogies, but that's the that's just the way that I uh, think of these things. So that's my first. Supposedly, we have a storm coming up at the end of this week. That's a good thing. That's a that's a good kind of rain. That's tomorrow. <laughs> Ms. Murillo. Well, the recession was so uncomfortable, you know, for me and my family personally, and I saw the city as well um, in pain. So my inclination is to be, you know, conservative with whatever we do, um, even though much is being made of the liberals being in charge on the city council again. Um, is that why, Mr. Samario, you were suggesting this super majority to spend, what did you call it? Yeah, the policy reserves. All right. Why, why did you make that recommendation, sir? Since that's more for me than it is for Mr. Samario, I'll answer the question. And it was to, uh, we recognize, and if the city attorney here, he would remind us that if a council policy is adopted by a majority, the council could modify that policy by a majority. So the supermajority 
you know, in effect, a, a majority could get rid of the supermajority requirement that we're recommending. We just felt, and we've we've listened to the discussions over the last year, that it would call more attention to the fact that you're using reserves, um, and it can call increased attention to it because I think in the good times, as Councilmember White indicated, we use the reserves. I think it was almost like we felt, oh, no problem, there will be more reserves next year, and they were used, and all of a sudden everybody goes, wow, what happened to the reserves? That it would force us to have a little more discipline about using the reserves, and, uh, but we recognize that it's, it's not, you know, it's something that a majority could change if you wanted, but I, and, and we pushed that a little bit. We, we thought we would be a little provocative and throw that issue out because we think it's important that when you use reserves, you're very careful about it, you do it. You know, we would have though, you know, we would recommend the use of reserves as a part of an agenda item and it would just be on the financial part and then part of the recommendation. And I don't think the council, I mean, we, it was clear that we were using reserves, but people didn't really think about it that much at the time when we did it. And that would mean that not only it would require, if you passed a budget that used, used reserves, it would take five votes according to this policy as well as in the middle of the year if you approved a labor contract that meant that we had to dig into reserves to fund it that you'd have to have the five votes or you'd have to amend the policy. Thank you. Okay. Um, one of the things that I was most interested in in this exercise is the, the actual detailed policy about when to use reserves and when to replenish them. And um, the reason for that, as we discussed when council was talking about this earlier, was that the people who serve on city council generally are serving for no more than eight years. Many of them come with no experience in finance, and even if they have finance experience, they usually don't have municipal finance experience. So there's a lot to learn here. It's a complex topic. And uh, I'm very appreciative of the earlier council back in 1995 that created the reserves, but I think realistically we also need to create a use of reserve policy. And to me, that encompasses several things. First, um, there needs to be a good objective way of evaluating the fiscal condition at any given time. And that would be, I would imagine, some combination of, of uh, revenue trends, the economic outlook, uh, current condition of the city, uh, which could inv involve all kinds of different environmental factors. Um, but I think that there needs to be some kind of objective measure of where the city is and what the revenue trend line is above or below a threshold line so that we could have something sufficiently detailed. I understand, Mr. White, I understand your idea of not wanting to make this too complicated. But on the other hand, I'd like to be able to provide guidance um, and give people assurance on this council and future councils that there was some forethought involved both in using reserve funds and in replenishing them. So it seems to me it would be good if we could develop both uh, guidelines on what the fiscal condition of the city is and the economic outlook, as well as some guideline about thresholds or triggers that say when it's okay to use reserves and when we should be putting surplus money back into reserves. Um, and it also seems to me that there needs to be something about, um, you know, there are different circumstances under which you would use reserves. For instance, the disaster one, that's fairly clear. You know, if there's an earthquake or a major fire and we need that money, we'll use it for that. Uh, but the economic uh, contingency fund is a little more complicated. Um, we might have, for instance, related to a disaster, let's say, an earthquake or a fire, God forbid, and we realize that there's going to be a temporary downturn, let's say, in tourism. So it seems to me that it would be okay to use uh, the reserve fund pretty freely to backstop the unanticipated revenue decline because we think that revenue decline is going to be very short term, maybe just a year. On the other hand, when we were going into the current recession, it was pretty clear early on that it was going to be a serious recession and possibly a long-lasting one. So even though the need was great, it seems to me the policy there should have been to be very prudent in how much 
of the reserve we allocated each year because we, we knew going into that recession we weren't going to be able to re replenish those funds anytime soon. So even when it comes to the use, even when we've determined by whatever these criteria turn out to be that it's okay to use the reserves, we still need a policy that says something about how much, how quickly. And I, I think that, uh, so that's one, that's one whole area that I would like to see some work on uh, and definitely another committee meeting before we make any recommendations to council. Um, as far as the, the, the other huge problem here to me is, is the, the capital reserve fund. Uh, we've been very fortunate over the last few decades to have the RDA money at our disposal. And even with that, I don't, we have not really kept up uh, with our infrastructure maintenance needs. So this is going to be one of the most challenging parts of this, of this whole discussion is figuring out how to, well, first, how, how large should that fund be? And I'm not sure how we go about that. Uh, hopefully the infrastructure task force members can point us in the right direction on that. Um, but that, that in and of itself is a huge task and figuring out a, a from a city policy point of view, how to build up what is going to obviously be a pretty large fund. That's going to, that's going to be a real challenge, practically and politically. So that's, that's something I'd like to see some more substance on as well before we meet again. Mr. White. Thank you. I appreciate those comments. Uh, uh, yesterday I um, attended the Water Commission meeting and they were talking about their budget activities for or, or our budget activities uh, next uh, year and they were looking at uh, trend lines in their uh, reserves and uh, how in that situation there's uh, huge amounts of dollars needed for a, a project and that's why when you look at the at that uh, chart up there the water has has the biggest um, you know it has more money in reserve than the than the general fund does, and um, and that they're going to have a, a, a somewhat different, and, and that's it's all justifiable. It's a good you want to put a whole bunch of money away for the cater treatment plant or whatever these things are going on, and it may be that that's going to be a slightly different set of of criteria than what's applying to to something else. So I just I, I it felt a little bit unique with that system. And so maybe that would get a, a, a slightly different look than, uh, than the other elements we're talking about here. Any more comments? Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, meeting adjourned.